Today, the two of us are going to talk about education. We're going to talk about the importance of story in secular culture. We're going to talk about filmmaking. We're going to talk about the medieval mind. We're going to talk about our mutual admiration for C.S. Lewis and... Metallica. We're going to talk about Metallica <laughs> and shoes and sealing wax and <laughs> ships and cabbages and all kinds of other things. I am Jason Baxter. I teach in the PLS program here at Notre Dame and serve as a curricular consultant for the St. Thomas More Academy in South Bend, a new classical school in town. Um, but the star of the show today is my new friend, Michael Flaherty. I've known Michael for about one week, <laughs> but such is his, is his talent, he's made me feel that we go back for decades. In fact, he called me last week um, on Sunday. There was a football game um, a week ago, you might remember, and he just began something like this. So how about that game last night? Notre Dame's front line has really improved. And from then on, we were just right in the middle of everything that mattered. Our ladies football team, C.S. Lewis, education. And yeah, it was great. He made me feel like we've, we've known each other for a couple of decades. But in addition to having great powers of friendship, Michael Flaherty is something of a Renaissance man, combining the virtues of the active and contemplative life. In his career, he's done a little bit of everything. He's been a teacher. He's been a weekend tutor. He's worked for education reform. He's been in politics. As of 2000, he turned filmmaker and co-founded Walden Media. And he's currently or he served as Walden Media's president and now is currently with Think Again Studios as a, a producer. So Michael, welcome to South Bend. Uh, thanks so much. And to talk about Lewis, I mean, Margaret's done such an unbelievable job with this conference. And Carter's always done a great job. And, the first time I spoke with Margaret, just like the first time I spoke with you, and the first time I spoke with Dr. Hurlbut, and C.S. Lewis says, a friend is someone who, one minute into the conversation, you say, you think that way too? I thought I was the only one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well. And it's those kinds of insights that make yeah. Lewis so great, and that you nail in your book, The Medieval Mind, and um, uh, I actually recommend the audio book, uh, because you have Simon, you have one of the two Simons. You have Simon Preble. Is he your... Simon Vance, yeah. Yeah, Simon Vance yeah. Is, is your narrator. And so everyone should download that. It's a, it's a great listen. Great. Michael, I was hoping you could start by telling us a little bit about Michael 1.0. That is pre-2000, Michael. You're in the middle of it in the public school system and starting to kind of come to some kind of diagnostic conclusions about culture. Could you just tell us about what you're doing and what you're seeing as a, as a public school teacher and... Um, and what came to be put on your heart? Never taught in the public schools because the unions would never have me, and they, they had all kinds of rules about that. I, I actually worked, um, my first job was probably the most impressive. I was a personal shopper at F.E.O. Schwartz on Fifth Avenue, and um, I was in the Nintendo department, and during halftime, Patrick Ewing, the great uh, New York Knicks player, came in, and the segment producer said, wouldn't it be hilarious if that fat kid beat Patrick in Nintendo basketball? And so there I was on CBS back when there were only a few channels. You know, the cable wasn't that popular. And when my dad saw me with a uh, purple smock with a hobby horse with a teddy bear riding on top of it, he said, little fella, I think it's time you moved back to Massachusetts, got a job with the government, and got on with your life. <laughs> so... He got me a job with the president of the Senate in Massachusetts. His name's Bill Bulger, a brilliant man, one of my favorite people in the world. And he was fascinating because he's fluent in Latin, fluent in Greek. His brother is number one, was number one on the FBI's most wanted list. And they grew up in the same housing project. They grew up in the same bedroom. They went to two separate high schools. And he was just committed to the fact that your zip code should not dictate where you go to school. And he thought the reason why his brother made the wrong decisions in life had everything to do with where he went to school, or to use Lewis's memorable f phrase, he didn't read the right books. Yeah, yeah, you, you love to cite Lewis on Eustace on that, don't you? Yes. Yeah. And so some of these observations got into your 2010 Waiting for Superman. Yes. I watched a little bit about that. I think my kids are finally impressed that uh, the research that Daddy is doing. We were sitting on the bed together watching clips from, uh, from Michael's films, and I think they finally thought that dad was relevant. Um, <laughs> but so we were, I was watching, I've been watching clips from Michael's film all week, and uh, you know, Waiting for Superman has this incredible moment in which these kids are hoping for, there's a huge lottery 
that they could get to go to um, a, a better school. And you know, there's a big audience of kids out there hoping that their number will be called. And I, I think is, is a, it feels to me like a really complicated, kind of messy human story. On the one hand, you're, you're cheering for the kid, right? You're cheering for these kids who want to go to school, want to do well, want to go to get into the good schools. But at the same time, you think, this is a seriously broken system in which you have to cheer for the kid to win the lottery to get to go to the school that he has all the capacity to, to get to. So it seems like you must have been thinking about some of your experience in making that film. Yes, and also, as you can tell, that's performative. And the whole reason why, and I don't, I don't think many states do it anymore, why we held lotteries was to illustrate the unfairness that the school that you go to dictates your future, and the school that you go to is going to depend on whether or not, you know, the ball pops up in the lottery. And it was too heartbreaking for the children and for their parents after a while to, to experience that. And anyone here that's a parent knows nothing makes you more helpless, feel more helpless than when you can't provide for your kid. And they, children know when they're getting a lousy education. Mm -hmm. And we had... Uh, you know, my start was I always taught outside of the schools and we would just have our little, you know, runaway uh, schools and there was a group called the Stepping Stone Foundation and we created a curriculum for kids in the worst school district. This was pre-Hunger Games, District 11. <laughs> and um, only one kid a year was getting into the exam schools. Like New York, Boston has exam schools and if you get the highest score, you get to go to this elite school for free. And so I used to teach at Princeton Review and I wrote a curriculum for how to get a good grade in the test. And we got 31 out of 32 of those kids in. But we had to teach them on Saturday mornings. And it's hard to motivate a kid on Saturday. So yeah. I didn't want to jump right into quadratic equations. <laughs> so I would say, what would you do last night? Oh, we watched television. Oh, we you know, went to a movie. And then one week, someone said, oh, we saw Titanic the next week. We saw Titanic again. And then the next week. We got some, went to the library. We got some books out on Titanic. Oh, we went to uh, saw an exhibit on Titanic, and you wouldn't believe how cold the water was. You got to put your hand in the water. And I said, oh, I think there's an idea here that the films can be a catalyst to get kids interested in history and in literature. So it's 1997. Titanic comes out. Everyone's driving with their windows down, their Honda Accord, singing, here, there, wherever you are. <laughs> yeah. right? And you realize the incredible educational potential for, for this medium. Yeah, and the, and the fact that a Canadian opened the door. That's you know, right. Jim Cameron directed it, and Celine sang the song. It's very exciting, yeah. You know, never before have two Canadians teamed up and done something so impressive. It was, <laughs> it was groundbreaking, groundbreaking times, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, but joking aside though, the, see, the film becomes an important medium, but not just for entertainment, but for educational value in, in your eyes. Yes. Yes, and it also, it's, it's the other parent. Uh, a lot of the children that we were teaching, you know, had a mom that was working two or three jobs, and maybe the grandma, you know, would be watching them. But for the most, most of the time, they're watching television. Now they're, you know, on the internet. And so rather than just curse that or be censorious about it, you just got to give them a better alternative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I th but, you know, in addition to that, I mean, this is where maybe we can start getting to some of the Lewis. Um, this, it's not just that film has a huge distribution, but there's something kind of magical about story itself, right? Of course. Because when, you were in, um, when you were in these school situations, um, did you increasingly feel that, that narrative, that the power of story was was lacking that in addition to sort of scientific facts, which, you know, dear old Eustace got, right, about granaries and, uh, and what, what's the other? Uh, uh, the fat kids quote. doing exercises <laughs> yeah, exactly. in the third world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lewis's yeah. words, not mine. Grain elevators, right. um, e imports and exports, tariffs. Yeah, yeah Lewis yeah, yeah, Lewis gives us a Eustace who knows how to uh, flatten curves and plot graphs and so forth, but you felt that story was somehow lacking and film could, could provide this for um, the underprivileged. Yeah, and I like, you talk about Dr. Johnson in your book, and Dr. Je jo Johnson always said, example is more efficacious than precept. And so even when you boil stories down, like Frederick Douglass has an incredible story, but it's all summed up with his quote, if I can do it, so can you. So that was the name of the charter school that we found. It was the Frederick Douglass Charter School, and 
we were trying to find those examples of people who believed in something uh, that nobody else believed in, um, and everyone thought they were crazy for doing it. And at the end, uh, conventional wisdom and popular culture were proven wrong, and this person that had a hope in the unseen, whether it was their own potential or uh, you know, the fact that a, a rabbi gave his life for us 2,000 years ago, um, when they're proven to be correct, uh, makes people think twice. Yeah, Lewis throughout his whole life I mean, came up with a bunch of different metaphors to describe what story felt like. He said that if you read a lot of stories yourself, you've read a lot of books, and you meet an unliterary friend, immediately you'll notice the difference. Uh, but he had a hard time exactly pinning down what it was. I mean, sometimes he says that reading literature, reading fiction in particular, is like walking through a landscape, which is a high compliment from Lewis since he loved to spend so much time walking through these beautiful landscapes outside of Oxford, right? But it had somehow, it was like a landscape. Sometimes he says it was like breathing atmosphere. What, what, do you, what is the magic of story? What, is it, what does it do that a, a graph or a data set cannot do? Well, Voyage of the Dawn Treader talks about this, um, that when the Pevensey children you know, encounter a dragon, they know what to do. But Eustace doesn't know what to do because he didn't read books about dragons or knights or heroic courage. So uh, they, without preaching, they teach you the power of virtue and they teach you that the hard thing and the right thing are the same thing. Yeah, I was thinking in, a, in another um, essay of his on myth, um, Lewis says this remarkable thing that, as, as we all know from Abolition of Man, Lewis's sort of chief diagnosis of modernity was, modernity was that it was fragmented. It was fragmented into, into various academic disciplines. But myth, he thought, could somehow be this integrating unity, right? That it could take these, these pieces of the human soul, our affective dimension, our intellectual dimension, our moral dimension, and begin to sort of bring them back together, to, to unite them in a way that most of these sort of, most of these pieces of the heart, pieces of the brain, pieces of the soul, are pursued in independent directions. But myth was this kind of incredible act of poesis, um, of, you know, like uh, you think um, magician's nephew, watching the world sung into existence. In some sense, that's the divine. Singing it into existence. Yeah, that's yeah. the divine archetype for every myth maker afterwards. You yeah. think Lewis felt that too? Uh, w without a doubt, and uh, Lewis also, um, you know, God redeems all things, and Lewis had a terrible childhood. You know, he lost his mother at an early age, which is a, a very difficult thing to overcome. He had the tyranny of the British boarding school, which really sounds miserable. Um, and uh, he, he, he certainly felt it, and he understood paradox the same way that our Lord understood paradox. People, you know, the first shall be last. What does that mean? Um, and he understood, uh, you know, someone said, well, you know, is this factually correct? It's not factually correct, but it's true. Mm. And that would just always throw people. Yeah, and it wasn't myth. the, yeah. you know, no bill and all due respect. It wasn't like the Bay Area dime store Buddhism. Oh, the sound of one hand clapping. <laughs> you know, like, you know, it, it, stuff when you really contemplate it, uh, it, it makes sense. And mm -hmm. in terms of what you were saying earlier about television, um, when Lewis was talking about you could tell if someone was non-literary, I think it has more to do with the moral imagination. And so uh, I remember my mother told me, uh, Michael, honey, if you ever meet someone and they say, I only watch public television, run like hell. <laughs> <laughs> They're the most boring people in the world. <laughs> they, they know all the right answers. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, speaking of holding opposite things together, um, in one of your essays, you say that you're not afraid, you haven't been afraid in your films to show some sort of violence. Yep. Right, which, which you also admit that sort of worries a lot of your audiences, that uh, that should be censored out of your films as well. What's your, what's your take on that? Why are you willing to portray, you said one of your favorite films, your first, right, was Holes? Yep. In which there are some violent scenes. Yep. But nevertheless, you didn't want to take those out to make a, a, a perfectly G movie. Why, what's your thinking behind that? As long as it's organic and it's, and it's part of the story. You're not gratuitous. Yeah, yeah you don't, you don't want to lie to kids and you don't want to lie to your audience. Um, but also, I think it's, it's Chesterton. You don't want to show them knights. 
Uh, I mean, you don't want to show them violence and, and dragons to give them nightmares. You want to show them to them so they know they can be defeated. And Lewis is writing in the age of the atomic bomb and the Stasi and the Iron Curtain. And with our kids being born in a world like that, why, why be dishonest with them uh, rather than let them know that they're Lake Walesa away you know, from, from freedom and, and shaking that tyranny? So not gratuitous, but if we give our children a vision of the world in which there's no challenge, there's no evil, as you say, there's no possibility of being a knight. Right. And, and the, the critical part of it all is, and it goes back to uh, paradox, is you never want to glorify physical violence. You know, we, we still want to maintain that great pacifistic streak that our Lord had. And, you know, it's, it's always a, a last resort. But not be under any delusion that our, our, our pacifism won't be tested, right? Yeah, and, a, and, and the, the story of freedom is that uh, freedom's never given, it's taken. Right. So Lewis was not a pacifist. Um, and, but I, I was thinking of this, uh, reading Michael's article, I thought of this wonderful uh, quotation from The Necessity of Chivalry. I grabbed this book off my library shelf today. Uh, it has a lot of good Lewis quotations in it. But I mean, Lewis says in The Necessity of Chivalry about, uh, about what was unique about uh, um, sh the chivalric code. The important thing about the chivalric is the double demand it makes on human nature. The knight is a man of blood, and iron, a man familiar with the sight of smashed faces and the ragged stumps of lopped off limbs. He's also a demure, almost maiden-like guest in hall, a gentle, modest, unobtrusive man. He's not a compromise or happy mean between ferocity and meekness. He is fierce to the nth and meek to the nth. Medieval chivalry taught humility and forbearance to the great warrior because everyone knew by experience how he usually needed that lesson. It demanded valor of the urbane and modest man because everyone knew that he was as likely as not to be a milksop. We need to bring back milksop. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, what a great insult, you know? <laughs> it is a good insult, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, he was, we, we forgot to mention it's Veterans Day. He was a veteran, you know? And, yeah, there and, was a very influential experience for him, wasn't it? Yeah. It appears he, in almost all of his writings. He understood war, and, you know, there's not much glory in the, uh, on the battlefield. And, but also, um, you can't tolerate uh, what was happening in Europe during World War II either. You, you had to make a, make a decision. Um, and just like now, you know, you, luckily we, we have a few brave folks, um, and I just, uh, that's why I really love Notre Dame is they're fearless, you know, in terms of this is the elite, you know, these are the smartest people in the country. Um, and they're not afraid to talk about what they believe. And they, it's a fair fight. And intellectually, um, you know, their ideas win. I heard a great podcast, the Ethics and Culture podcast is fantastic with a uh, val the valedictorian a few years back at Notre Dame, brilliant woman. She was the valedictorian there, and then she was a Fulbright, and I think she was a valedictorian at Oxford, and she's in uh, uh, medicine. And uh, it was incredible to hear the true, not the false, aw shucks, Taylor Swift, like, <laughs> I can't believe I won my 80th Grammy. Um, this was a genuine modesty um, that, that she had, and... Um, just been so impressed and you know thank goodness you know that there are still people here that again it doesn't have to be a foe that you face physically um it could be an idea in the culture that people are too cowardly to uh to put their hand up in the air and and say enough well i, I feel like anytime you receive a compliment you always think i hope to endeavor to ever live better you know up to those standards yeah. so We'll, we'll we'll do our best, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you so one of the one of the we're talking about this sort of magical aspect of story and why our secular culture, our fact loving uh, culture, needs story in particular. And one of those aspects is this this union and integrative principle of story. It brings these different you know fragmented bits and pieces of the human soul back together. Another one that you touch on though is this wonderful uh, idea that story can make the old young. And you say, uh, you quote in one of your Wall Street Journal articles, 
Nowhere is this more poignantly expressed than in his dedication to Lucy Barfield of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, dedicated to his uh, goddaughter, Owen Barfield's daughter, um, Lucy. And he says to her, you are already too old for fairy tales, but someday you will be old enough to start reading fairy tales again. <laughs> and I was just thinking, I know you, that we talked a little bit about this interesting PBS documentary that came out about a decade ago called Merchants of Cool. Um, basically how a worthless product like Sprite can become like one of the fastest growing uh, you know, soft drinks in the world. And in this, in this interesting documentary in, in PBS, of the sort of like MTV culture of the 90s, I think anyone who grew up in the 90s, you watch this documentary, you explain what it felt like to grow up in the 90s. Um, but anyway, this, in this documentary, the, the marketers boast that they don't sell a product anymore. They sell a lifestyle. And that's the secret behind it. And they have all these you know, interesting ways to s create images. Um, they're not selling a thing. They're selling a lifestyle. But part of that, you know, part of that marketing technique is, is it K-G-O-Y? Is that how you say it? Kids grow old younger? Young. Yeah. Yeah, kids yeah. grow old younger. In other words, part of the appeal of, pro of MTV and Sprite was trying to sell to younger kids an image of, of being an adult already and being sort of recklessly pursuing those things. So if the marketing culture is trying to hit the accelerate button, on kids, Lewis is kind of countercultural, trying to make old people young. He's right. going in the exact opposite direction. Right. I mean, it's like the ancient mariner. You know, you become a sadder and wiser man. You you experience these things, and you realize that um, they're not what the culture told you that they would be. And um, what's amazing when you look back at that documentary, um, those people thought they were immortal. And you look now, and it was AOL, uh, Vivendi. Um, all these companies that are now out of business. There was no TikTok. And so I don't think people understand uh, how ephemeral fame is, or as Robert Downey Jr. said, they said, you're hot again. How does it feel to be hot? And he goes, well, hot means destined to become cold. <laughs> so I hold on to this very loosely. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not really interested in, um, you know, this, this sort of temporary fame. Yeah, so this kind of re rejuvenating power of story, right? To make the old young again. Uh, reminded me of another uh, Lewis essay, uh, perhaps you've seen it, Talking About Bicycles, in which he describes how um, all of life seemingly unfolds in these four stages. Of There's a pre-enchantment stage, there's an enchantment stage, or there's a disenchantment stage, and a re-enchantment stage. And he uses the example of a bicycle. You know, there's a time in which you're a toddler, it's just, you know, part of the contraptions of the adults. There's just no interest. But then there's that magical age, you know, eight, nine, ten-year-old boy. You get on your bicycle and you have access to the whole neighborhood, all the football you could want on a weekend, right? And, but then when you have to ride it regularly, Lewis says, you become disenchanted with it. And he says his, he's having this conversation with his friend in which his friend says, now that I am old and I can take public transportation or I can drive cars if I w would like to, to get on a bicycle is fun again. And as I'm going by, I actually, you know, f see the wind in the trees, and I've experienced something of re-enchantment. And so, I mean, for Lewis, though, this is not just bicycles, um, but it happens in all kinds of domains. His, his friend brings up the example of marriage, and Lewis says, I have to remind you, I've been a bachelor. And his friend replies, oh, that's a pity. For in that case, you can't possibly understand this particular form of re-enchantment. I don't think I could explain to a bachelor how there comes a time when you look back on that first mirage, perfectly well aware that it was a mirage, and yet seeing all the things that have come out of it, things the boy and girl could never have dreamed of, and feeling also that to remember it is, in a sense, to bring it back in reality, so that under all the other experiences, it's still there like a shell lying at the bottom of a clear, deep pool, and that nothing would have happened at all without it, so that even where it was least true, it was telling you important truths in the only form you would then understand. But I see I'm boring you. <laughs> well, he, <clears throat> I think that uh, not enough is said about his brilliant writings about love. And, you know, that epistolary relationship that began with, you know, a anarchist poet, you know, in New York City, Joey Gresham. And uh, I, I always liked to, uh, you know, it might come as a surprise to you, but I've been on the receiving end of many, it's not you, it's me, 
speeches, you know, from birth right up until I met my wife, God bless her, um, and uh, who stuck with me. Um, but he, he writes something, because I think we've all heard from other people, like, I just wish it was like those first few months when we met. And Lewis said, that is the most immature insight, because the human species would be extinct. We'd never leave our bedrooms, and we'd just be writing bad, po bad poetry to each other. <laughs> At some point, you need to mature, you know, to a, to a, to a different kind of, of love and appreciation that's just not yeah. based on that initial instinct. You've inspired me to pass out a free senior thesis to anyone who's looking for one, but I wonder if this very idea of the process of enchantment, disenchantment, reenchantment could actually be read as a kind of master narrative of four loves itself. Yes. Right, that there's the sort of you know there's a sort of like love of the cradle there's a love of the infant right you if you provoke the infant enough in the right ways with enough smiles you get a smile back right it's this kind of you know this uh, um, this family love which ultimately turns into uh, an erotic love of romance and marriage but if you get high enough in some sense and I, and I wonder if even this is what Lewis is continually doing at the end of his books in some sense you don't you don't abandon it right. Plotinus says that you climb the ladder to the good and kick away the ladder. But a Christian vision is almost like you turn around and then are able to embrace it all. Yep. Right? When you sort of pro you know, progress through these loves, then you get them all back. But now you realize they were just subspecies of the thing you really wanted. And also, they're, you know, everyone's familiar with uh, Joseph Campbell and uh, the power of myth. If you ever get a chance, uh, Kurt Vonnegut is proud to say that he flunked his PhD thesis at the University of Chicago which was on the shape of stories, that all stories have a shape. And he said the best story ever written is Jesus. And he said, or the man in the hole. And it starts out and uh, you know the person's here and then gets incredible praise and then sinks you know, to the lowest possible point uh, that they can sink to, only to rise uh, to a height that nobody has ever achieved before. Yeah. And um, something Tolkien called eucatastrophe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but Vonnegut, Vonnegut was much funnier. British, <laughs> British Tol Tolkien's not so funny. No. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, his vices. <laughs> um, sorry, I grew up Irish. We don't like the British. And um, <laughs> <laughs> but but there is definitely. Sorry, what were we talking about? <laughs> You're talking uh, they just, Vonnegut's they, they man. They throw me off yeah. the British. I, they, how they, how they, much funnier Vonnegut is yeah, than Tolkien? Yeah. Yeah, well, Tolkien didn't have kind things to say about Lewis's writing, you know? I mean, he thought it was kitchen sink mythology. You know, he's like, what, you got Santa Claus in here? You got, uh, you're just throwing everything into this story. Yeah, yeah, but I think, you know, maybe even what we were just saying a couple of minutes ago at least might explain part of it from Lewis's perspective, right, is that when you get to this, this sort of, this pinnacle, the, the eucatastrophe, to, to borrow from Tolkien's language, and turn around, all those things were suggestive of it. Yeah. And then, uh, but I mean, this is something that interests me as well. Again, we're, we're talking about this kind of rejuvenating property of story, the joy bringing power of, of story. And one of the funny pieces in Narnia is how oftentimes Bacchus or Dionysius shows up. Yeah. Who seems like a really unchristian character, right? Like yeah. the god of wine and drunkenness and wild parties, you know? And, but in Lewis, he show, you know, Bacchus shows up more than once. And he brings a kind of festivity, he brings a kind of elation and happiness that none of these well-mannered Christians had expected. And even Aslan says, you are not nearly as happy as I intend to make you, right? Yeah. So there's something about this you cat, you know, you catastrophic aspect in Lewis as well, this rejuvenating power that my story is merely suggestive of a type of joy that you've only begun to long for. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think that, uh, again, when you go back to parents, um, Anytime you see your kid, you know, sad or, or, or discouraged, it, it just crushes you. And it brings you back to our father, you know, who created us uh, fearfully and wonderfully. And how much it must bum him out. Like, look, I created you. I, I did all this for you. And when you think of it in that uh, sector, it, it helps a lot. And also, I think that Lewis does a great job of saying, when you look back on this, it will be heroic. It's awful now, and it's brutal, um, but uh, sacrifice is the holiest good in the human heart. And it's expressed in a lot of those different stories, and um, you know, especially in, in Narnia. And uh, I 
read The Lion, Witch when I was younger, and I thought it was cool that a lion could talk. And then I read it um, after reading Lewis's Apologetics, and I couldn't believe, you know, Aslan's line when they said, we thought you were dead. You know, the witch killed you with her deep magic. And he said, but there's a deeper magic that's older than time. And it says, when an innocent man gives up his life for a traitor, that time itself will stop and death will be reversed. That's the gospel. Um, yeah, and maybe even story itself, trying to wake up some of the deep magic. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's always been there. Although two weeks before the movie came out was, there's a deeper magic. It's based on what's right and what's wrong. <laughs> and um, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, who snuck in a post and changed this one? And so I'm like, why don't you add, like, comb your hair and brush your teeth? Like, people confuse, you know, that whole sort of behavior part, just like you're saying about Bacchus, you know? Like, you know, I love John Newton. I love the song Amazing Grace. And um, as you guys know, John Newton was a slave trader, and we're sort of brought up with this idea that, uh, and it's true, there was a storm at sea, and Newton said a prayer and said, God, if you can save me, I'll, I'll become a Christian again. And everyone thinks from there he became an abolitionist. No, he became the slave trader that didn't drink or swear at his slaves. And the reason why Amazing Grace is such a powerful song, it's when he was a Christian, he realized he was blind and now he could see. And uh, we were talking earlier um, about uh, Oswald Chambers that, you know, take the log out of your own eye. Um, and Bill is always talking about uh, space and, and time and uh, I don't fully, fully grasp it. But um, what Christ is saying is that that's something we got to do minute by minute. It's not a one time, we got to constantly course correct because like Sue writes in the screw tape letters, you don't need to make somebody Ted Bundy overnight. Just inch by inch, have them be like, oh, it's so distracting the way my wife eats her toast. I hate it. You know, and just keep filling their minds with all these little petty things, mm. you know, and then eventually, inch by inch, they'll get away from the light. I'm reading Madame Bovary right now with my seniors, and I think that's at least one of the things that Flaubert is trying to do. He's trying to take this not bad country girl and reduce her to something which is, uh, which is loathsome, but it goes by the inch by inch principle. Yeah. And she begins by just being irritated by how her husband chews. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think you're on to something. Yeah. yeah. Bill suggested that we should work on our blocking and switch places the, so that uh, the other half of the audience can see. Oh, uh, he's a DP now? He's yeah. the director of photography? I think so, yeah. You want to switch? <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, half the audience can see. Okay. The, yeah, yeah, I know. The, the, they're the happy part of the audience. I wasn't exactly no, sure how to read that see message. My bloated though, yeah. visage. Yeah. You like it? <laughs> And should, are we going to leave time for questions? Yes. Yeah, I, I just wanted yeah. to give one more sort of wonderful quotation from, uh, from one of your speeches at the National Prayer Breakfast. Yeah. Um, you said that maybe the best evidence that Dorothy Day was right, right in that she thought that God didn't mind if we learned from other stories than the one he wrote. Right? That there's some you know, creative human potential in adding stories. Maybe the best evidence that she was right comes from the efforts of various tyrants over the years to crush religious freedom. This is Michael. And rid their lands of spiritual literature. Malcolm Muggeridge once related a conversation he'd had with a Russian dissident in the 1970s. He told Muggeridge that there was a spiritual revival happening in the Soviet Union. I asked him how this could have happened, Muggeridge wrote given the enormous anti-religious brainwashing job done on the citizenry and the absence of all Christian literature, including the Gospels. His reply was memorable. The authorities, he said, forgot to suppress the works of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Yep. What can do that for us, Michael? The, well, Besides your you know, the, those near-death experiences are something because you know, Dostoevsky was imprisoned and on Christmas Day, was taken in front of a firing squad, and uh, they had, you know, their, their guns weren't loaded, and they did what every, you know, bully and tin pot dictator did, and, you know, just sort of click the guns, you know, just to scare them and let them know that they could kill them at any time they wanted to. And it had such a profound um, effect on, on Dostoevsky. And I, th I think the key is um, prayer. And the stories are obviously critical because I think that, I forget the number, but I think Christ is uh, 
asked 164 questions? Oh, I just read it. 183. Okay, it's 183 but I'm questions. I'm just plagiarizing you, yeah. And he answers only two of them. And the remaining 181, he tells a parable. And I think that if we're less prescriptive, comb your hair, brush your teeth, and if we get away from the behavior part of it and we go back to the you know, origins of our faith, I'm a great sinner, Christ is a great savior, and he gave his life for us. Um, nothing's more transformational and freeing than that news. Yeah, the, the Cambridge theologian David Ford uh, uses this grammatical metaphor. He says, most of the time Christianity operates in the indicative or the imperative mood, right? right? <laughs> in other words, most of the time Christianity <laughs> describes things, this is the way it is, and then gives demands, ethical demands. You ought to do this. And Ford says the Christianity of the future will work also in the subjunctive mood. It'll be this mood of longing, this mood of wonder, this mood of, really, Lord, can it really be that way? The mood of question marks and exclamation points. Um, and I love, uh, that's Tevye. Um, my mother lo loved musicals, and so we used to always listen to Fiddler on the Roof. And uh, we saw her quite a bit. And is always praying, you know? And finally, one day, uh, he's had it because his horse breaks down and just can't go forward anymore. And he said, God, I understand when bad things happen. I'd even understand if my daughter married a Gentile. But what do you have against the horse? <laughs> Did you have to hurt the horse? And just to approach God in that voice of a child and just get directly to the questions, and then the Holy Spirit will work his magic. I have one last question, um, and then we'll turn it over to the audience if you'd like to ask some questions, and Michael and I can take a shot at them. Um, can I make a snobby, actually, maybe it's not a question, Michael, maybe it's a snobby comment. Imperative? Um, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe an indicative <laughs> followed by an imperative answer. Um, and I, I've spent my whole life studying literature, so I have a kind of uh, almost reverence for, for the literary word. And I've often doubted, this is going to be the most controversial thing I'll say today, I've often doubted that film can um, bridge the gap between itself and literature. Like, I like film. You know, it's good. You know, it's oftentimes ennobling. You know, I think of something like Cinderella Man, something like Christopher Nolan's films, right, Interstellar or Dunkirk. I like them. I still don't know if film has ever bridged the gap between itself and literature. And I was just wondering, do you think, has that happened? Can that happen? Or is, is literature always the sort of gold standard, the, the platonic form which film wishes that it could be? Right. The, um, I think it does go back to stories, a and I think different people um, are interested in, in experiencing them in different ways, you know, and it's um, now much more into audiobooks uh, than I'm into reading, um, a lot more into short form video than, you know, feature films, and uh, I think any time there's a story that has anything that's that's true or good or beautiful and not preachy, um, I think it works. And I, and there's obviously plenty of examples of, you know, when uh, ER came out, applications to medical schools went up, you know, 10,000%. When the first Top Gun came out, everyone was, you know, lining up to um, enlist. Um, and uh, it goes on and on and on. And I do think that the stories we tell, whether they're through film, um, or literature, but I mean, less than half of the United States has read a single book in the last 12 months. So it's under half read um, fiction, read literature. So um, we got to find other ways to communicate these eternal truths and, and use these other, other platforms uh, to get people to live that examined life. Yeah, I, I've increasingly just thought of maybe even the goal of education of sort of getting stories, not just encountering them, but of uh, writing them on the heart, writing them on the memory. And uh, I, I had this wonderful encounter with one of my teenage daughters in which she was saying something rude to, to one of her uh, siblings. And I was about to wind up into a good old dad lecture. And instead, I, I was in the middle of reading Brothers Karamazov, and I said, hey, let me tell you a story. That was weirdly disarming. Like, okay, <laughs> what happened to the lecture? And I told her the story from Dostoevsky of, of The Onion, right? Of that Grushenka tells, of in which 
the, the woman who only gave away one onion was going to be pulled out of the lake of fire, holding onto an onion by an angel. And then other sinners started grabbing onto the ankles and they started creating this big sort of like paper clip like chain, right? And then she looked down and said, get off me. And the onions snapped and they all fell back into hell. That's the story she tells Alyosha. I told that to my daughter and she said, you're right, dad. <laughs> so I began to think, what if I... <laughs> I, I... What if I didn't have, you know, one story in my heart and in my mind and my memory, but had 42? You know, just to choose a random number. Um, I guess it's not so random. It's, it's always... It 43, yeah, okay. Con concepts are tricky with, with children. Yeah. Um, I, I got a... The, my daughter, Eileen, when she was five years old, said, uh, uh, you know, Dad, uh, you know, is it okay to suffer sometimes? And I said, it's not fun, but, you know, you know, Suffer, suffering can instruct, pain instructs, and we can learn from those things. And the next day I leave for LA and I get pulled out of a meeting and it's my wife and she said, what did you say to Eileen last night? <laughs> and I said, why? And we were sponsoring some, some, some children in, in Africa. She goes, let me read you this note. Dear Michael Anthony, thank you for the kind note that you sent to me. I am glad that you like your school. I'm glad that you like your clothes. Gotta go, hope you suffer a lot. <laughs> and then my daughter Reagan today, like it was so cute. They each, they each left me a note for each day that I was gone. And Reagan said, uh, uh, Dada, good luck with that wicked smart guy on Friday. <laughs> Which is you. Is and she me? said, just remember, you're already saved and you'll be with Jumbo, who was my dog, and Nana. Um, in heaven one day. So um, even when you bomb or alternatively scare or anger people, which you usually do, you can't lose because you're saved. Have a good day. <laughs> that's, that's comforting. I, I hope I can join all of you, yeah. All right, we, we, can, we have time for some questions if anyone would like to ask Michael a question. Yes. Definitely Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. And, and I would distinguish Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe from the Chronicles of Narnia, which are terribly inconsistent, and I would argue some are unreadable. And once we got through the first three movies, it's like, oh gosh, where do we go now? You know, the silver chair or, you know, uh, a horse and his boy, but which has a fierce, like, cult following, by the way. You gotta be careful who you trash that book in front of. But, <laughs> The one book that I think is incredible is uh, The Little Prince. It's not C.S. Lewis. It's St. Exupery. And St. Exupery was the Conrad of the skies. He was one of the first people to ever fly an airplane, crashed in Chile, and became this big celebrity author, tough guy. Uh, and then um, World War II happens, and he's in New York. And his friend Leon Worth is back home, and he's Jewish, and he's in France. And so... He puts on the ill-fitting uniform of a French fighter pilot and drops off this manuscript at HarperCollins with all these pictures about um, an aviator who crashes over Africa. And it's got all these beautiful uh, parables in there. And the introduction is, um, it's all about how adults miss the plot. And he said, I'm dedicating this book to an adult. I hope you'll forgive me, but he lives in France where he's cold and he's in danger. His friend Leon Worth was Jewish and he was living in, in France. So when St. X got to fight for the French on his first mission, he was shot down over northern Africa and never found again. And he left behind this manuscript about a pilot who landed, crash landed in the sands of northern Africa and learned all of these incredible lessons um, about everything from alcoholism, you know, uh, uh, why do you drink? I drink to forget. Forget what? That I'm sad. Why are you sad? Because I drink. And that circular logic of the addiction. And, um, and then there's a great scene where they're thirsty and they can't find water and they finally find water. And the little prince says, this is the best water I've ever had. And what makes it taste so good is everything we had to go through to get it. it makes it taste so much better. 
So I, I love that book. It's the best, I think it's the best fable out there. So if you buy a Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe now, you get a Petit Ponce for free? Yes, you yeah, do. Okay. Yeah. In the French. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the movie's not bad either. Yeah. Number three, Abolition of Man. Number two, Transposition, uh, the sermon. And number one, The Weight of Glory. Um, it seems to me if you could only encounter one thing by C.S. Lewis, you read The Weight of Glory. Um, I don't know, maybe even the first paragraph of The Weight of Glory. Done. <laughs> What's amazing about Lewis, though, it's not like Van Halen when Sammy Hagar became the singer. Like, anything you pick up is awesome. Like, you really can't go wrong. He doesn't have that many things out there that are... That's a fun was, challenge. I'm trying to think of something I've read by him I don't like. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. I can't come up with anything. I'll, and I'll by the way, the Little Prince movie is great. I was being modest there. Like the, Mark Osborne did an awesome job uh, directing that movie. It's got all different styles of animation. It's on, it's on Netflix. So check that out. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, wow, that's a great question. I feel it. I don't know if yeah. I can articulate it. Thanks. Um, yeah. Have my back. I appreciate it. <laughs> Come on, Baxter. What do you got? All right. All right. How do you film this? This is the end of uh, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. It's Lewis at his most mystical. Lewis, so in, you have to understand that in Dante's Paradiso, heaven is made up of intelligible light. And so this is as close as Lewis can get, can get to this. Tell me how to film this. Every day and every hour, the light became more brilliant, and still, they could bear it. No one ate or slept, and no one wanted to, but they drew buckets of dazzling water from the sea, stronger than wine and somehow wetter, more liquid than ordinary water, and pledged one another silently in deep drafts of it. And one or two of the sailors who had been oldish men, that's one of our themes, who had been oldish men when the voyage began, now grew younger every day. Everyone on board was filled with joy and excitement, but not an excitement that made one talk. The further they sailed, the less they spoke, and then almost in a whisper, the stillness of that last sea laid hold on them. All right, I think I've got an answer for you. Is that good literature walks to the periphery of language and then dives over. And that somehow literature, um, maybe like uh, minimalist music by Arvo Parrott, right? He, Parrott says himself that he, his goal is to reduce, uh, reduce music to silence, but a pregnant silence. I think literature does that. In a way, in a way I don't think, how many, how many images per second? 26 images per second? I, just, I think... The, like, the, the frames per second? Yeah. You know, it, uh, it, it depends. Something around there. 60. Oh, yeah. 60, yeah. I, I just think inherently the sort of like hubbub and busyness of the very medium itself I just don't know if it can reduce itself to contemplative, pregnant silence in the way that literature can. Well, cause that's, that's my best shot. Like, again, back to St. X, like he, he, he liked to play with children because with children, language is optional. And I think that you might be making the argument for film in that sense because you can't portray it with dialogue. Um, there's a great description there. It would have to be strictly image and score and no words and you've been through this you know we did our best with reap it cheap and sunsets and that kind of stuff but uh we we fell short it's a challenge but it can be done and I, yeah yeah terry is, and by the way maybe one the, candidate yeah that's like uh he's like you know as we all know from the hebrew scriptures you know like yeah. Uh, what if I find ten good men? What if I find five? What if I find one? Terry's the one good man in Hollywood, but he lives in Texas. So, like, <laughs> I don't know if that counts. And when Jim Caviezel was auditioning for Thin Red Line, he, a woman answered the door, and uh, he had, like, a ten-minute conversation with her. And then Terry said, uh, okay, well, you have the job. He's like, I don't have to audition or anything? And he said, no, I just like to see how people treat other people. He's a great man, and he's got this beautiful wife, Eki, that he's known since high school, and he's a awesome. He's a great man. Yes, sir. For those of us who use film and, and literature to teach students, um, I see a, a current, a, a contemporary problem. You mentioned Titanic from 97. In 1997, if I mentioned that film in class, every one of my students would have seen it. Now I mention a film 
and few students have seen. Not a 1997 film. I mean a film made today, and few students have seen. And I think that's not because students aren't watching movies. I think it's because they have so many other sources to go to. There's not one common narrative, a cultural narrative, that we can look at and pull from and make reference. You mentioned the 42 stories that you can tell. Yeah. Uh, you have to be telling the students who don't know them. I mean, so my, my question is, is there is there some something that we can encourage students to, to share uh, together, whether literature or film? Do, do you see this as a problem? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm hosed. I, I don't know. You know, I don't know <laughs> what I'm going to be doing. Like, because my kids could not be less interested in film. And um, they, they're interested in, in, you know, short form video. They're interested in, in, in short stories. So getting them to watch any movie is difficult um, until it enters the lingua franca. And so now the new, ironically, they have a longer attention span for series. So it's either something that's three minutes or 12 episodes of an hour each. But the 120 minutes, that's being lost. So, um, and Stranger Things is I was going to say that. I get a lot of mileage out of Stranger Things. You know, so you things, still yeah. have these yeah. cultural moments, you know, and events. And I think that, uh, you know, it's like the marketers always do. There's, there's drag and nag. You know, so there's the movies that adults drag their kids to. And then there's movies that kids nag their parents. I want to see this. I want to see this. And the key is to strike that balance to where, the, you know, the kids are... are are nagging, but I think it's adolescence, it's follow the leader. So the big question is, how did, how did Stranger Things, other than being outstanding, how did, how did it get to be such a cultural phenomenon? Yeah, I, and I just, I, I guess, you know, maybe, it's okay to make uh, positive, optimistic remarks every once in a while, right? <laughs> it's okay. Um, I, I think, I think, you know, I mean, with whatever sort of loss of, uh, of attention span that, uh, that we see, it seems like you know, embodied, in-fleshed performances, even if it's as simple as telling a story, but telling it well, still has this magical power to enchant children. And so, I mean, maybe in some sense, as things increasingly get digital, it actually creates a space for us to tell stories, which then means that we have to do the hard work of getting them into the memory, articulating them well, and performing them. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe as, as things increasingly go digital, Enfleshed, embodied encounters will become ever more important and, and more moving, right? Performances in time, performances in space, performances, you know, in three dimensions. It yep. does give us the opportunity, though, to make the gospel that one touchstone. And uh, my wife, uh, every movie we made that was successful was on my wife's reading list at St. Peter's in South Boston, where she used to teach. And one of them was Bridge to Terabithia. Plot spoiler, the girl dies at the end. And... Um, <laughs> Nobody would go near this movie, and so uh, Fox, uh, you know, we have our meeting, and uh, I said, uh, so what, how, how come you guys don't want to distribute this? Three reasons. Dead girl, dead girl, dead girl. <laughs> and so Disney, to their great credit, they distributed it, and there's this beautiful scene where this girl who's never been to church before goes to church, and her friend is em embarrassed, wondering, like, is he going to judge judge him? And, and he's like, so what do you think? What do I think? I think Jesus is the coolest person ever. I don't know why my parents didn't tell me about him. He's like Aslan or Abraham Lincoln. He just wanted people to love each other, and they killed him. And I love that, the, the wonder that, uh, that, that, that comes with that. Yeah, great. Question? Yeah, back there. Yes, sir. Hi. You just heard a very interesting the looking for an image of something uh, not depend upon uh, its mode. Uh, you guys were discussing about literature versus film. Yeah. And the example of George McDonald's, where his prose be half the time, you know, uh, pretty result in that. But the story itself, presenting an image that was entrancing the witch, so Louis once heard the story of the Red Cap of the Castle, and it narrated on the radio. And that story stayed with an imprint. We also had another second part to it that the particular detail, the image is transformed into particular detail, the atmosphere, the mood, the kappa element, the reality, <coughs> that made it um, unique to that story. So the silver share is white silver, well, moon, white, lunar, madness, right? So it's the silver rather than the color, the fittingness that 
makes that particular image rooted in the story and instantiated in a way that's distinct from this other version of it. I'm wondering if you guys could talk about that relationship between the myth of what is being transferable, but then the specific details that orient it and root it in something that's not just the same as uh, some other content, but it's distinguished. Jason, I'm, I'm, I give that one to you. That's a hard one. I was hoping but, but, you'd do but it. it's a really great insight. It's essentially you're just talking about how everything gets short circuited and it goes right to your heart and your soul. Yeah, but then one story it cannot be just the same as the other. Uh, when, when you go into when you build a world, this world is specifically this kind of place. Um, Lewis gave the example of um, in uh, Last of the Mohicans when a man is uh, being uh, uh, attacked by. Uh, Native American, and the man is holding um, an axe, uh, or a hatchet, rather, than a knife. And Lewis says it's more fitting in the story that he's holding uh, a hatchet rather than a knife or a gun. But there's something that makes that feel distinct and unique. So you can retell it, dance to the world. You can retell the story in different versions. But the specific details of that world are all kind of uh, organized together. I mean, this is you know, Michael Ward's whole piece. Yep. Yeah. That th this I'm not trying to be evasive, but I think you did just explain why Stranger Things is so popular. Um, because it was a fresh take, you know, like kids in the eighties, you know, in the mall. Whereas if and Amazon's very tight lipped about this, but their enormous investment into the Lord of the Rings series is a bomb. The, the, the ratings are terrible because people have had enough and they want to experience a new world and, and, and a new mythology. Do you think it's just, it's just a saturated market? It's not a production thing? I think that swords and sorcery stuff gets a little dull after a while. Um, I always thought like when they were like, what Narnia movie should we make next? And I was like, well, we should make a movie where like, Lucy's selling tickets, like, outside of the wardrobe, like, hey, who wants to go to Narnia? 50 bucks each. And, uh, you know, just send it up and make a parody of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, because you want to, you want to visit different, different places. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, a really difficult question, but I also think it's, if you could answer it properly, you could, maybe, is this too audacious? You could put your finger on the pulse of Lewis. And uh, hopefully this won't be, too technical, but it seems to me there are two reasons in Lewis that you might read literature. One is an ethical and psychological reason. We already talked about that. Integrating the different faculties of the soul, basically nourishing the mind at the same time you're nourishing the heart so that the will becomes strong. That's one. Two, it's an epistemological thing. And Lewis explains that in the following metaphor, which I borrow from transposition, that imagine the age before, uh, before uh, reproduction of music, uh, electronic reproduction of music, you go and hear a Mahler symphony. And it's magnificent, it's complicated, it's like the symphony for a thousand voices, right? And you love it, and you want to hear it again. What do you do? You buy it transposed, transliterated, right? For piano, maybe with four hands. And you get a buddy and you play it. And if you've heard it before, you can remember when the violins come and when the flutes come, and you can kind of reconstruct it in your imagination. But the fact is you have a higher level language, which is trying to get into a lower level language of a mere keyboard. And you'll always fail. It seems to me, what well, Lewis thinks about basically the spiritual life is like that with respect to temporal reality. Uh, Robert Harrison quoted Plato last night, right? That Plato says that time is the image of eternity, the moving image of eternity. I think that explains what Lewis is doing. He has a value, an eternal value, some sort of virtue, which is trying to get into this world, show as much of itself as it can, but because of the limitations of time, of our flesh, of our you know, very sort of mortal existence, it can't show itself fully. But it could show itself in multiple ways to suggest that there's always something richer behind all of it. It's what you could call thinking iconically or thinking participatorily, right? And it's just deeply platonic, it's symbolic, it's all over Lewis, and I think, I think that answers why he writes the way he does with the multiple symbolism and also answers why Lewis, or why Tolkien had a hard time appreciating it. What he thought was heterogeneity, I think in Lewis was probably just late antique Platonism. 
You can <laughs> tell what I wrote my dissertation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Only here would that happen, right? Speak, speaking of late antique Platonism. <laughs> I love pagan storytelling. Um, I was a classics major, and my kids and I love to watch like, Studio Ghibli movies. Yeah. Uh, we love uh, Hayao you know, like, Celtic folklore of, of, of the song you see. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, the Tom Moore. Yeah. Ronanish. And... Yeah. Yep. Um, and I feel guilty about it sometimes because I'm watching. It's not entirely clear how it becomes Christian. You have to sort of sort through it. It's not right on the nose of what that time that is. Um, so I guess my question is, is, is that legitimate? Is it legitimate for Christian? I guess another another aspect of this question is, why is Christian storytelling sometimes just black? Is it because we've been raised in a, uh, a world that has been Christian for so many centuries we've heard the story, we know it's so Well, there's just so many variables. It could be the performance. It could be the story. But the, in terms of, like, the, the shame and the guilt, uh, just remember, you know, when you read Scripture, um, the source of that is the enemy. God never wants – he doesn't use shame. He doesn't use guilt. Um, and ironically, that's what's built into all these social media apps. That's why there are things like um, keep the street going among your friends – uh, make sure that you share this with your friends and you'll get bonus points and you'll get status because there's a course at Stanford where Dr. Hurlbut teaches um, that like the Pinterest guy, the um, Twitter guy, almost all these people took that shame and guilt are great mo motivators. You go to those negative emotions. So I, I would never let those get in the way. And I just love how truth is in plain sight and, you know, Everyone has a story to tell, and we can learn from everyone. And the studio, it's just transcendent. It's so beautiful, the stuff that they do there. And if you're ever to look at the top 20 movies in Japan, you'll see that they all have to, an element of sacrifice to them. It's 8% Christian population. Um, but any film, uh, you know, Lion, Wish, and Wardrobe did incredibly well there because of the sacrifice theme. Uh, the Champ, if you ever saw that tearjerker, uh, that did unbelievably well over there because the idea of heroically giving up your life so that someone else can have it. Uh, and look, this, Paul knew this on Mars Hill, right? And you have to speak in the language. And um, I know that there's a lot of Irish people in here. And, um, you know, there's an integration of some pagan traditions with Christian traditions, you know, to ease people into things. Um, as long as they're not, you know, inching you away from it, uh, and, and you have mastery over it, but just don't that just remember, just rebuke that shame and guilt. Cause that, that, that comes from the enemy that doesn't come from our Lord. Yeah. I mean, you can definitely find, um, I can't find the quotation, um, on the fly, but you can definitely find wonderful things of Lewis saying, I think we're probably going to have to make our audiences pagan before we can make them good Christians again. And I think, it's, I think it's connected to what we were talking about earlier, these sort of stages of enchantment and disenchantment and re-enchantment, right? That, um, well, regrettably, we've become disenchanted with Christianity, um, <laughs> as perhaps due to user error and not the product itself. <laughs> um, and we think we know what it is, and we think we know who God is, um, but we sort of, you know, as moderns commit micro acts of idolatry on a daily basis, and so I think Lewis, if Lewis were here, I think he'd say, yeah, you got to go pagan. Yeah, you got to go back to Orwell until we have faces, right, in which people feel the pain of their inadequacies as human beings and long for, long for something they don't think it exists, a Messiah. So I think, I think in a way, I think yeah, precisely by returning to a sort of a pagan sphere, we can reconstruct the heart in all of its, in all of its complexities, its eternal desires, but also its unflinching um, gaze on, you think of Orwell at the end of Till We Have Faces, right? I wanted to be a philosopher. I wanted to be a stoic. And every morning I am overcome by my lust and by my 
my, my anger and fail. Basically, Lewis has got her to the point where if Jesus appears, she's ready. She's the woman at the well, right? So I think in some sense, like kind of recreating an advent, an advent existence is one of the, one of the powers of specifically, you know, going to this domain of the pagan imagination. Yeah. I think we have time for maybe one, two more questions. Yes. Hi, um, I'm wondering, there's kind of this idea circulating, or at least there has been in the past, that there's only a set amount of plots or ideas out there. Like, I think Tom Stockard in his Arcadia explains that, you know, there's really only a certain amount of stories or ideas, and every time there's an author or some sort of creator think, creative thinker, they're just reimagining that in a new way that's yeah. so exciting. Um, and in the same way, that's echoed through pagan stories and Christian stories, right? There's yeah. a blood story everywhere. There's, you know, some sort of death and resurrection that's not entirely new to Christianity. And I'm wondering, do you agree with that? Do you think that there is some sort of set yeah, I think it's like keys on a piano. I, I think there's a finite, I don't want to say if it's five or if it's seven, but there, there I think there's a finite number of, uh, um, you know, beats and plot points and an infinite number of applications. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that um, because I was just thinking, um, and I wish we could have some of the details uh, from Michael, maybe on another occasion, um, but the, the very process of making a film is this just massively collaborative enterprise, right? You have all these specialists working together. You have writers, you have directors, you have producers, you have visionaries, you have right, people who do technical stuff. Um, in a sort of postmodern world, how we tell stories is actually strikingly pre-modern. Um, and Lewis at one point says, um, when we read traditional books, we're not reading the work of an independent artist we're reading what is almost such a traditional book. Whatever he does, Mallory's personal contribution to the total effect cannot be very great, though it may be very good. We should approach the book not as we approach Liverpool Cathedral, but as we approach Wells Cathedral. At Liverpool, we see what a particular artist invented. At Wells, we see something on which many generations labored, which no man foresaw or intended as it is now, and which occupies a position halfway between the works of art and those of nature. In other words, Lewis sort of sets in contrast the kind of, you know, the modernist, like James Joyce in, you know, in Trieste, alone writing his, his perfect manuscript, which is original in every single way, and it's exclusively his, right? In fact, like maybe no one can even understand it, right? It's only his. It's um, versus a sort of traditional culture which gets the manuscript and translates it. But if you're a classicist, you always think it's translated badly because the people have all the freedom in adding it, and there's, it's sort of you know it's more like jazz, right? So I think I think I think that's I hate really, jazz, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think that's an interesting kind of postmodern pre-modern <laughs> parallel, and there are lots of them. Right, but in, ter in our terms of authorial composition. Yeah, yeah. no, and I, I, but I yeah. like what you're saying earlier about, you know, the best music would be silence. That would be sort of perfection, because, you know, that was the point of punk rock, was you know, b people had their flowing robes and the, you know, the five different keyboard sets that they were playing, and the whole idea was, you know, how do we strip all of this down? And, you know, John Lydon, who was an Irish uh, guy that was living in London, you know, was always picked on for being the Irish Catholic kid in the neighborhood and got, uh, I forget what it was, Bill, but it was a terrible disease that made him, gave him complete amnesia. He had no memory of what had happened um, the last 10 years of his life when he came out of the coma. And people would have to tell him like, I'm your mom, you know, come home now. And then people realized we can take advantage of him. And they would say, oh, hey John, I'm your big brother. Why don't you come this way? And they'd lead him down an alley and, and, and beat him up. And from that was born a huge uh, distrust for liars and people who would not tell the truth. And that, that was the birth of that uh, entire movement. So it's the, um, like we heard in the awesome address last night with Thoreau, like simplify, simplify, simplify. There's something about getting down to that the basic essence, you know, and then seeing, you know, what can you do with this? You know, it's just these four chords, what can you do? Well, there are Scandinavian metal bands that listen to Arvo Pert for inspiration. So I think uh, punk rockers as negative theologians, that'll be your, your next talk, Michael. Well, right? one, out, one out of four people in Finland is in a heavy metal band. Yeah. <laughs> Fact. There you go. Uh, I think we have time for one more. I think I promised 
Yes, sir. Yeah, good. Yeah. Um, similar question about sort of comparing film and literature. Um, you guys kind of talked about it in terms of like professional representation, of which what each one can do. I'm curious about more like faculty of imagination. The yeah. difference between the literature, you're kind of you're doing the heavy lifting. Uh, it's sort of a home cooked meal, so to speak. You're having to come up with the images yourself, as opposed to film being sort of spoon fed to you. I'm yeah. wondering if you guys have any thoughts on that. Uh, again, Lewis is probably writing before film really starts to become a big meeting, but um, yeah, like how that plays into like the, the cultivation of the imagination. Um, does film weaken our imagination in that sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because your imagination's infinite. And film is one interpretation of that decided by a committee. And, uh, and maybe a focus group. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Do you want the girl to die or not? Yeah, or, or, or in our case, it was, you know, a stepson. It was uh, Douglas Gresham. He had the ultimate trump card. So he was C.S. Lewis's son. And anytime there was a disagreement, he'd say, Jack hated that. And we're like, oh, well, okay. The authorities, and we realized half the time, like, your stepfather never talked to you about that. <laughs> but, you know, what can you say? But, yeah, the, I always struggle with that because it's so much more. And that's actually the whole point of Bridge to Terabithia is how do you externalize that internal world? Well, there's one way that you can do it. But Great. Well, now, now I, if I had known where this conversation would go, I would say we, we should have structured it as an Oxford-style debate which we all voted at the beginning, right, is can film bridge the gap between itself and literature? And then we could vote again and see, and see if we had any movement, but maybe next time. Michael, can you tell us what to look forward to next? What are you most excited about in the next two or three years? The, uh, I'm <clears throat> working on the marketing campaign for a movie about Mother Cabrini, and um, it's 100% financed by a Notre Dame graduate, uh, Eustace Wolfington. And uh, like the persistent widow, there was a nun who came to visit him once a year and said, you should make a movie of Mother Cabrini. You should make a movie of Mother Cabrini. And finally, through a series of providential events that all happened over the course of 24 hours, he went ahead and, and did it. And the movie is fantastic. And uh, it's going to come out in some time in 2023. And I think it's going to remind people of the social gospel about how one woman came over here, not speaking a word of English, and uh, you know was a champion of immigrants, was a champion of healthcare, was a champion of justice, and her North Star was our Lord. But what's even more amazing is, and we all realize this, you know, people in our own, you know, fam family and friends can uh, turn, you know, they have wings and they can fly away. Um, you know, her own church opposed her on things. The uh, archbishop in New York opposed her on things. But uh, she just followed Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And this girl who wasn't supposed to live past one month uh, and uh, lived one of the richest lives of the 20th century that sadly is not spoken about enough. So that's where I think film has that power is hopefully it'll get more people interested because I saw the movie Entertaining Angels about Dorothy Day and then I read The Long Loneliness and then I started reading stuff by Peter Moran and then I started reading The Catholic Worker and all because I called in sick to work just to see a bunch of movies. <laughs> there you have it. There's your imperative. <laughs> thank you so much. Michael Flaherty. Yeah. Jason, thank you very much. Thank you guys. <laughs>